All right, so last week we covered the Fourier series, and that's given as uh, for any signal f of, applies for any signal f of t that is periodic, and that says that if the signal is periodic, then we can decompose that into a weighted uh, and a sum of complex exponentials, where e each of the complex exponentials are weighted by c k. And the increments, uh, the, the number of um, the complex exponentials, e, j, omega, that we sum to g omega k that we sum together, is um, th th they are the finite increments. So the difference between k and k plus 1 is uh, it, it's a discrete sum, remember, because we, we did the summation. So um, in lecture 11, we uh, extended that to the continuous signal with the Fourier property. So recall in lecture 11, we showed that CK is equal, CK is equal to one divided by T of zero, f of t j k omega naught and f of t is equal to so the truncated Fourier transform is when we try to um, change the Fourier series, which is a discrete sum of complex exponentials to a more continuous integral. So we're summating across all the range of possible values that it takes on across the period, all the possible frequencies, E negative J omega T DT. So this is the continuous extension of the Fourier series. So something to note is the omega. So we replaced k omega with omega. And we can do this. And this is a conscious decision because the k omega naught, again, remember these are discrete intervals. Omega is continuous. So also note that as we take the limit as t approaches infinity f of t, we get the Fourier transform. We get j omega t dt. As t approaches infinity, the omega approaches zero. Omega naught, sorry, T naught, omega naught. So um, how do you make sense of this? So we replace the K omega naught with omega when we do the truncated Fourier transform. So we don't have to worry about that going to zero. But in a way, this also makes sense because we have a discrete sum of different frequencies. When we change to omega, the number of increments between each frequency that we want to include in the summation becomes infinitely small because it's a integral, it's a continuous sum across, it's, it's a continuous sum. So, um, yeah, and that's how we get our Fourier transform. Something else to note, and I haven't been drawing this, so let me, we do ft j omega. So why, why do we include the j? Why not just include the omega? Well, um, that's to signify the Fourier transform. So when we have different variations of the Fourier transform, like the more general Laplace transform, or if you do a discrete signal processing, there's other types of Fourier transforms, we will need to distinguish between them. So this just shows the type of Fourier transform that we're doing, but we don't have to worry about that quite yet. So it's FTJ omega, but in general, FTJ omega is just F omega. All right, and let's see if there's anything else. Oh, and also, um, yeah, so we took the Fourier series, which 
is more specific where we need a continuous signal and we extend that to an aperiodic signal. Uh, we transform that into continuous into frequency space that is continuous, not discrete. And the, uh, and the Fourier transform will exist for any convergent signal. So let's start with the shifted delta function. Now for this, we want to review the sifting property first. So recall sifting property. Recall when we oh, recall that when we have, as we often see in the convolution, when we have an integral from negative infinity to infinity of the delta function, let's just look at the simplest case, f of t. It's messy. Okay. We have the delta function multiplied by any function of our choosing. So when whenever we see this, we don't have to explicitly calculate f of t because of the sifting property. t greater than 0 or less than 0 will not take any values because d of t will be 0, and it will nullify it, cancel it out. So this is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity delta t f of 0 d of t. And that's going to be equal. We can draw it out because it no longer depends on t. Delta t dt. And this, of course, goes to 1 by our definition of the delta function. And so we just get f of 0, the very same f of 0 that we find within the function. So it's we, we can pull it out of the integral unscathed. So we don't have to worry about that at all. So um, now let's apply that to our case where we have an input of a shifted delta function. So f of the Fourier transform of that will be the integral negative infinity to infinity delta t minus alpha of uh, Wait, what was the, oh, yep. So by the given definition of the Fourier transform. So with this, we know that this is equal to the integral, given the infinity delta t minus alpha, because of this term here, it will t will not take on any values when it's greater than lambda or less than lambda, but only when it's equal to lambda. So it's equal to negative j omega. So we can put this in here, lambda dt. So it no longer depends on t. So this is more or less a constant in the eyes of the integral. In, in the eyes of the term that we're integrating from. So we can draw this out of the integral. And then we just get the sum of the delta function. Even if it's shifted, we know that the area under the delta function is equal to 1. So we get e negative j omega lambda. So that is our Fourier transform. So keep the sifting property in mind. It's useful and it's very easy to mess up in more complex functions, or it's very easy to try to brute force integrate E negative J omega T when we don't do that and we'll probably arrive at the wrong answer if we use that approach. So let's see. We have our values. So similar to Fourier series, if we input the delta function in frequency space that will be seen as a complex exponential if it's a shifted delta function. So this is a very useful one. Um, also, generally recall for 
when we have a complex exponential, uh, when we have a complex exponential, this theta corresponds to the phase, A corresponds to the amplitude. So we're really able to, in a lot of cases, since we, when we encounter complex signals, it might be easier to evaluate it when we split it up in terms of the amplitude and phase. So in our case, we know that the amplitude of fj omega is equal to 1, because the a is we, we don't have any amplitude factor that we're multiplying the complex exponential by. And the angle of fj omega is equal to negative lambda omega. Let's see. Oh. To get negative lambda omega. So we have our first Fourier transform. All right, so next we're gonna go through some examples. So let's start with the constant function. So, um, zoom in more, no, okay. So first of all, let's try doing the integral directly. So f of t is equal to one. So if we apply the definition the Fourier transform, get negative infinity, infinity one times e negative j omega t dt, and this gives us e negative j omega t divided by negative j omega from t equal to negative infinity to infinity. And this is a bit surprised because as t approaches negative infinity, it cannot be evaluated. evaluated. So this, do, this does not converge. Well, this is an interesting case where we do have a frequency, quite, quite a clear um, uh, signal for fjw, but we can't find it by applying the, the Fourier transform directly. And in this case, we can use the principle of duality. So Recall that in the first problem that we showed that the shifted delta function is equal to negative j uh, lambda j. Let me see. It was um, negative j omega lambda. So that means if lambda is equal to zero, if it's not shifted, it's equal to the constant signal. in frequency space. Now we should start thinking right away the principle of duality. And recall, as it was covered in lecture, I believe, the principle of duality, where it says if we have something in the time domain and the frequency domain. So if we have a signal, let me if we have a signal x1 in the time domain, and we know that that turns transforms with the Fourier transform, when we're going that way. That's how it's usually represented. We know that this gives us the signal x2 in frequency space. So if we know this direct relationship, even if we switch it around and we get the same x2 in the time domain, we will get 2 pi x1 negative omega. 
so we will get uh, scaled and um, flipped version of the signal x1. Now, this formulation might seem a bit complicated, but quite straightforward to apply and to also recognize. So we're saying here, uh, recall in lecture that that we got the rectangular function in the time domain transformed let me actually just transformed into the sync uh, transformed into the sync function in frequency domain what we're saying is if we see the same signal in the time domain we also have some intuition as to how it'll look like in the frequency domain. It'll just be reversed with some flipping and scaling. So if we get the same signal cropping up in the time domain, then we know that's gonna be some scaled, and since the rectangular function flipped is the same, it's just gonna be a scaled version of the rectangular function in the frequency domain. And that's the entire principle of duality. And I encourage you to try to derive it yourself using the Fourier transform. All you need is just two different uh, substitution of variables to verify the principle of duality. And this is a very important one, especially in, when we have cases where we can't solve the integral even though it exists. So. Again, we know that the delta function, if we have that as x of t and xjw is equal to the constant signal, that means that if we input, let me, if we input xt, it's going to be 1. then we will get 2 pi, okay, 2 pi delta negative omega as we will get xj omega as 2 pi negative delta omega. The, delta, the direct delta is an even function, so we get 2 pi delta omega, which is equal to, is it x in this case? We have function f. So we get our result that f j omega is equal to 2 pi. It's a shifted direct delta function if we have a constant input. And so here is our principle of duality applied, where we use some prior knowledge up above and just we just flip it. Okay. Moving on, so now let's try finding the Fourier transform of some arbitrary signal. So we have x of t, and it's the decaying exponential times the step function. So in this case, we can directly apply the transform. We can try doing that. And uh, since we have the step function right away, we know that if lambda takes on any value that's, if t takes on any value that's less than lambda, step function will make it x equal to zero. So we can just start at lambda. It's e negative a t times e negative j omega dt. So that, oh, we can express as the integral from negative infinity lambda e negative t 
times a, oh, and there's a t here, a plus j omega dt. And we know how to solve these um, integrals from calculus. So. Okay, we'll get a negative one divided by a plus j omega in the front, infinity lambda e minus t a plus j omega d e negative a plus minus j omega. And that doesn't shift our limits of integration because we haven't done any sort of variable substitution. So we have negative a plus j omega. Um, and the integral of the exponential function, since we're integrating in terms of negative a, negative aj omega, is going to be the exponential function itself. So we get, let's remove the numerator. We have e negative t a plus j omega from t is lambda to infinity. At infinity, a decaying exponential function is equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about that. I would say equals goes to zero. And we just need to plug in the lambda. It's a negative lambda. So that, oh, no, we, we input the lambda. But since it's the second term, it'll have a negative sign. So the negatives will cancel out. So it'll be the exponential a, oh. Replace the t with the lambda. So lambda times a plus j omega divided by a plus j omega. And that is our Fourier transform. We have the signal cosine of uh, omega naught times t minus t naught. So this seems a little bit complicated, but uh, th this is more similar to the type of problem that we'll be encountering when we're trying to solve the Fourier transform. Usually the strategy for this is now that we are able to derive some of the fundamental signals that appear in a lot of different places, instead of applying Fourier transform directly, we can decompose the signal into uh, into into signals that we're more familiar with, that we know the properties of. Usually you can refer to Fourier transform tables. So while it's useful to be able to apply some properties, the, the Fourier transform directly for any signal that we might not have seen for some of these more, um, some of these layered signals where it represents a combination of functions that we know we can just apply some properties. So it was, uh, I'll show you an example. So we know that the cosine, we can, de we can represent the function as a convolution of the cosine function and the delta, let's see, the direct delta, so we can decompose that into two signals that are convolved with one another. Now, we showed the delta function that's going to be delta function t minus t naught gets transformed into e negative j t not omega. We showed that in the first problem, so we know that right off the bat. Now cosine omega not t, that's going to be equal 
to recall that we can um, express that in the following way, back from the way in the beginning of the class. And this is minus divide by two. So we can alternatively express the cosine in that way. And this makes it easier to solve in terms of the in terms of the Fourier transform. So uh, we also know we can uh, just apply the principle of duality. So since uh, we know that the shifted delta function gets transformed into the complex exponential, if we have a complex exponential as an input, which we can represent the cosine function as, we can represent that as two delta functions. And since it's even, the shift won't by duality. The shift won't even, the sh flipping across the axis won't represent a problem even. So um, that will be two pi times, um, let's see, delta omega minus omega. minus omega naught divided by two plus delta omega minus omega naught. Space, okay, divide by two by directly applying duality. So that's equal to pi delta Omega minus omega naught. Oh, th there's a plus here. Okay. And now we just have the convolution of the the complex exponential here and two delta functions. Not the convolution, I'm sorry. So we first use the property of duality and now recall the multiplicative property. I didn't leave enough space. Okay, we can make do. Okay. Recall the multiplicative property. So uh, Let's see if, uh, so we've decomposed our signal x1 of t into y t convolved with z of t. So we also know that x1 g omega. In the Fourier space, that's gonna be seen as a multiplication of the Fourier transform of y times c j omega. So we just out and multiply it. So x1 j omega, since we've solved y j omega and z j omega. And it's, yeah, it's just multiplication. So that's going to be equal to e negative j t omega. be equal to pi times e negative j t naught omega times the delta function omega minus omega naught and plus the delta omega plus omega naught. And we can't reduce the, the we can't reduce it anymore. This is what x1 will be equal to. The delta function, two shifted delta functions summed together, multiplied by the complex exponential function, 
multiplied by pi. Okay, so for the third part, so it's a third, yep, for the third part, we are given the Fourier series coefficients and the fundamental frequency of the signal, and we want to find the Fourier transform. And so this is going along the lines of the thing that we were talking about before. So going in between the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. So our signal is periodic. We're able to represent it with the Fourier series coefficients, and we want to show this relationship more explicitly. So let's start off by f of t. Let's start off with our function. Omega naught t. So we're going back to the Fourier series. This is our function. So next is a little bit of a leap of days. We can also express this as ck. So we isolate this. We want to bring in a continuous integral in some manner. So can represent this. I'm not going to write it in green to highlight it. A continuous integral from negative infinity to infinity of the delta function omega minus k omega naught times e j k omega naught of t. And so This doesn't change the function at all because we're summing across all units omega, which is what we're ordinarily doing. Um, this holds true by the sifting property. That we're able to make this transformation. Even though this function isn't, even though this function isn't a function of the omega, we could represent it that way. But um, it will hold true. It, it's like the mid-step in the sifting property where we substitute in the k omega naught. So, yes, this is the sifting property. Okay, let me make sure. Okay, so we can drag in, we, we can change the order of operations by doing the discrete sum first instead of the continuous sum. And we have the CK term that we're dragging in. So we're gonna be multiplying the Fourier series coefficients by these direct deltas that we've Right now, it seems kind of arbitrarily added in, but it will start to make sense, hopefully. Times E, J, K, omega, not T, DT. Oh dear, there's not too much room, but we can do this. I have confidence. So let me just work off this. So. This step, I think, is pretty clear. So I think we can do two steps in one. So we have a 2 pi here. And then we integrate. So we multiply by 2 pi and divide by 2 pi. And so that we also know f of t. We know f of t to be equal to 1 divided by 2 pi. Integral fj omega e j omega d omega. Oh, okay. 
So we're integrating across omega. So, yep, I wrote that wrong here. Of course, it's not t because we're trying to find uh, we're trying to find t. Of course, we're not integrating with respect to t. So we're integrating with respect. We're doing the inverse Fourier transform. And this is, uh, we know by the definition of the inverse Fourier transform. So inverse Fourier transform, which was presented at the very beginning of the lecture, is... So since we know these two to be equivalent, we see that we have two very, very similar terms here. And we know by the sifting property that we can replace this, the k omega naught, we know that we can replace Oh, I didn't write the T. Okay. So these two are the same. Therefore, we have found our FJ omega by forming the integral by playing around with it. So we have arrived at two different forms of the equation. And so thus we know that Where's a good place to, I'm, I'm gonna go a little, uh, okay, expand. Thus we have shown that F FJ omega is equal to two pi summation of from negative infinity to infinity of ck times d omega minus k omega naught. So thus, if we have the fundamental frequency in the Fourier series coefficients for our function, then we can directly compute the Fourier transform in the, with the following equation. All right, so for our final function that we're taking Fourier transform of, we have x1 equal to the rectangular function with some operations. So that's a negative t shifted by 3 and then uh, divide by 2 times the cosine function. It seems kind of complicated, so how do we go about tackling the problem? So let's go step by step. So Let's first focus on the rectangular function where it just seems like we just strained some arbitrary operations together. What sticks out? So in lecture we showed that the rectangular function, rectangular function of t is the sine function, the sinc function, sorry. The sinc function omega divided by 2 pi. So Fourier transform of the rectangular function gives us the sinc function. So what happens if we multiply by negative 1 half? Well, that results in both um, we have to adjust the amplitude by the scaling property. Um, dilating the in input in the time domain results, let's see, is it dilation or contraction here? So if we get two is equal to, we're expanding. So yeah, we, we are dilating in the time domain and a time dilation at, in the time domain results in a contraction and a scaling in the frequency domain, which is represented by two because it's by a factor of two. Since we take the absolute value of negative two, so that's equal to absolute value of negative two if we, times the sinc function, and we have 
negative 2 times our function, which is equal, since sinc is an even function, as is the rectangular function. So that should give you some intuition on the inputting an even function in the time domain, doing the Fourier transform of mean function. It gives us the even function of the, the frequency domain. Oh, yeah, we got rid of the two. So it's a contracted sync function. All right, and we also, next we shift it. So the order of operations is very important. So first you do the dilation and then you do the shift. Similar to how you would do that with convolution. So we're going to do the amplitude scaling because that's pretty straightforward and the shift at the same time. So we have the negative one half, which we did the dilation first, times t plus three, our new operation, the shift. So if we do a Fourier transform of that, We get four times the sinc function times omega divided by p. So we multiply everything by two and then we multiply by j three omega. That's how the shift in time domain and then the scaling. So those two things change. Thus, we have one half of our function, but we're also multiplying by the cosine. So what is the cosine 10 pi divided by t? Now, let me... All right, so cosine 10 pi divided by t, recall from the tables, Oh, okay. Cosine of t is equal to We can tackle cosine 10 pi over 2 directly from the Fourier transform tables. So we know omega naught is equal to 10 pi for cosine. And since it transforms into two delta scale delta functions, they're shifted by the fundamental frequency omega naught, plus and minus in both directions, we get this to be equal to delta uh, the pi. It's equal to pi times delta omega minus 10 pi plus delta omega plus 10 pi. All right, and so again, if we can involve a delta function, even if it's scaled by any sort of function, we basically input that directly in where o omega takes place due to the sifting property. So we are convolving, we're convolving the function one and function two, the result of which will give us x1. So thus, x1 j omega Yes, again, because we did this piecewise, and since multiplication in the time domain is equal to convolution in uh, the frequency domain, 
So we get for sync, and then we put in omega minus 10 pi. Oh, it's 4 pi. And then just bracket it times the sync function, and we put in omega. We put in first this term, we shift it. So it'll be sync uh, omega pi minus 10 times the exponential term e j 3 times omega minus 10 pi plus sync oh I run out of space here I'm not I'm gonna try to write this more tightly Let's see if I can zoom in more. No, no, I cannot. Okay. Omega minus 10 pi plus sync function omega divided by pi plus 10 times e j3. Oh, come on, please. Uh, 3. Um, oh, okay. So if we split the problem up into two parts, we get a pretty straightforward convolution in the frequency domain. No, I didn't mean to draw that as uh, And there's our final result. So here's an interesting case. Now we're doing an inverse Fourier transform where we have a signal in the frequency domain and we're trying to get the real time signal from it. So how do we go about solving this mess? So in reality, it's easier than it looks like. And we can do this with partial fraction decomposition, which we often do with inverse Fourier transforms. So we can write x j omega. We know that two plus two plus three j omega minus omega squared. It's a little bit funny that we have a minus in front of the highest degree term, but since we have complex numbers, that's a common sight. So we have to start thinking a little bit differently when we are doing our factoring. So it will be omega minus oh, plus, since we have a plus term here, let's do a plus term for both. So one plus j omega times two plus j omega. So recall for partial fraction decomposition, that means that That means that we can write this function as x j omega is equal to some a 1 plus j omega plus some b 2 plus j omega. And if this a and b can be solved by linear equations and it's by multiplying 1 times j omega times b and 2 plus j omega times a. And we get that a and b are 1, so this is equal to 1 plus j omega plus 1 divided by 2 plus j omega. So thus, from our handy dandy table of Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier, our, our just table of Fourier transforms, and by the property of linearity where we can split up the problem into two parts and do a Fourier transform individually, we know that x of t of the first part will be the Fourier inverse Fourier transform of 1 plus 1 plus j omega plus the inverse Fourier transform 1 plus 2 plus j omega. And we can refer 
to the tables for this. So this is a common, common, uh, common signal that we will encounter in the frequency domain. Be e negative t times the step function plus e negative two t times the step function. And thus, that is our real-time signal, which I also believe we derived earlier in the problem. Finally, a quick note on the convolutional property theorem. So recall the two um, multiplication convolution duality properties that we have in the Fourier transform. So we know that y of t, if that's equal to x t times z of t, that will be x j omega. Let's fix that. It'll be x j omega convolved with z j omega. And and importantly, um, importantly, y of t, if that's a convolution, which we will encounter a lot, especially LTI systems, that's how we represent the function. So let's have an h of t. That is multiplication in the frequency domain. This ends up being very useful and a reason why Fourier analysis is so popular in fields like controls or audio processing, why it's so ubiquitous. So as we said, y j omega, we know it's the multiplication of the individual component signals. So we can rewrite this as hj omega. Our impulse response is equal to yj omega divided by xj omega. And this is very important. We, it's very difficult to solve for h of t with convolution. But if we apply a Fourier transform, we can quite reliably, in a lot of cases where it's difficult if we do convolutional analysis, we can find h by just um transforming x and y and dividing the two results so um once we get that we can in the real time take the inverse fourier transform of h j w and we get our impulse response and that's very important so um this uh, this is used a lot in industry, like I mentioned, in controls. So consider the case where we want to design an H. So if we want to have some sort of filter and we want to find some H when it's convolved with uh, X that it will um, attenuate or zero out, certain frequencies, uh, then we can explicitly design this H, explicitly design this H where it will be equal to zero for the values of omega that we don't want included in the signal. And from there we can find the H of T and it's very useful. Something like into is FIR filtering. Uh, when you get the H of T, you can do something that might be very difficult to do, like uh, filtering a signal to take out the high frequencies in real time, where you just look at the past few time points and you can um, find an H of T in, that reliably takes out the low frequency components of a signal or if we want to retain the high frequency, if we have some sort of low frequency component that is giving us trouble. So this is used in audio equalization and um, yeah, it's uh, a little peek into why 
Fourier transform is so useful. Oh, so useful in industry.